Creating healthy environments for children to thrive in has become more challenging as society assesses the impact of new technology in our lives. Is there a disconnect between what our children need to be mentally healthy and what our modern world offers? What you need to know, next on Living Smart. Welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. For the past 20 years, Dr. Bruce Perry has been an active teacher, clinician, and researcher in children's mental health and the neurosciences. His work has been instrumental in describing how negative childhood experiences can change the biology of the brain and thus the health of the child. He has been the government's consultant for incidents involving traumatized children, such as the Branch Davidian siege, the Columbine school shootings, the September 11th terrorist attacks, Katrina and Rita hurricanes, among many others. A senior fellow of the Child Trauma Academy, today Dr. Perry will discuss how we can create healthy environments for children to thrive. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry, for taking the time to be with us. I know you're a very busy man. Um, we talked a little bit about this and what is happening in society today, today that is making it more and more difficult for children to thrive and to have a healthy environment. What is happening in modern society that's making it so difficult for parents and for children? Well, I, I think the major changes in the last two decades have been uh, a tremendous decrease in the number of healthy adults that are active mm. in the lives of children. Yeah. If you look at the demographics, the the average... Uh, size of an American household is now lower than three people. And that means that, you know, you could be a typical child and have very few adults present in your life. And then you'll go to school where there's ratios of teacher to pupil of one to 30. And then you'll spend six or seven hours a day watching television or doing some electronic uh, interaction with a video game. So essentially, the the number of human to human interactions where you are uh, being uh, nurtured and mentored and taught and uh, are just just decreasing dramatically. Let's talk about some of the things that uh, that we need to do as as parents or care- <laughs> caretakers to start building a healthier environment for children. For instance, you talked about setting boundaries on media, for example. Yeah. I, it, well, it's interesting that many people have said this in different forms, but the, the, probably the smartest thing to do when you're trying to think about how to get your children to change is to look at how you live. Mm. And if you can't regulate how much you watch television, if you can't regulate how much you're on your BlackBerry, if you can't regulate uh, how you manage your time, it's it's really unrealistic to expect that children are going to be able to do that as well. So. I, I think one of the most important things to do is look at your own life. Do, are you disciplined about how you have the television on? Is it on all the time? Do you have it on during meals uh, so it distracts from conversation? Do you have it on in the morning so it distracts from those opportunities to have little conversations before you your go to school? Or whatever. And uh, I, I think that that's one of the most important things. Be, you know, these these modern tools are our tools. You know, the Blackberries can be great. Mm-hmm. Uh, cell phones are great. Television is awesome. If you regulate them, if you have some self-control over when they're used, but the problem is so few of us are good at self-regulation. So we, we, we don't limit the hours of television. We don't say, you know what, that's enough TV. But what, what's healthy, for example? Some, yeah. some people may say, well, you know, seven hours is healthy for me or one yeah. hour a day. What do you think is healthy, even with cell phones? That's a, that's a really good question. And I think, I, I think for children, one of the most important things to remember is that there's a developmental uh, process where a couple of hours of television for a child at one age may be completely fine. But a couple of hours of television for a toddler is destructive. So it, there's a developmental change in what is acceptable and what is good for children and what is not good for children. The fact is, it's probably not good at all for children under the age of three to watch television. Um, anything that you think that they can benefit from on television, they would learn better in a relationship. Right. If you think that Sesame Street or some other educational video is is going to help your child, the truth is any content that they're trying to convey would be much more effectively conveyed if you taught your child 
or if some other adult or some older child interacted in some healthy way. Well, a lot of parents use television to, to you know, babysit. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm assuming that more than one hour a day for children in general is not a good idea. Yeah, again, I think it really show, it depends. Again. It depends on the child, and it depends on the on the content of the show. You also talk about the importance of empathy and kindness and teaching right. them that. Right. Tell yeah. me about that. Well, it, it, it's interesting, and it, just a little bit of a background about this. And we are interested in in the human brain and how the human brain works. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody who's watching knows that there's parts of your brain that are involved in in thinking. Right? right, and that there's parts of your brain that are involved in how you move, uh, and there are parts of your brain involved in visual perception. Right. There are also parts of your brain that are involved in forming and maintaining healthy relationships, and parts of your brain that are involved in love. You know, when you are able to love somebody, it literally is because there's part of your brain that's doing that. Now, all of these parts of the brain, your ability to sort of to type, your ability to, to write letters, your ability to read uh, any brain-related function develops in what we call a use-dependent way. Mm -hmm. The more you use it, the more it... The better you get at it. That's exactly right. And so if we are raising children in an environment where there just aren't enough relationships, they're not having much human contact. In fact, we've estimated that children in the modern world have one twenty-fourth the amount of relational contact than children in primitive hunter-gatherer clans. So... If you're hearing 1 24th as many words, you're going to be very, very, very poor at speaking. Right. If you have 1 24th as many relational interactions as you grow up, you're not going to fully express your capacity to be empathic, to be right. good at relationships. Right. And that's where we're really concerned because we see changes in the way children are in school, uh, the way they are with each other. Um, the way they engage in community, the way they participate and vote, all of these things are either directly or indirectly related to this capacity to be empathic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if we're, we're raising our children in a culture where there aren't enough opportunities to develop that brain-mediated capacity, wow. we're really in a bad trajectory. And, and that's where we are right now. What would be a normal number of you know, extended family relationships. Now, you know, in America, yeah. people move, so exactly. they don't have those extended families that we used to have. And you said right. we're now living three instead of seven people in a house. Yep. If I'm a parent, or, and there's a lot of single parents, yep. how do you create sort of that extended family? It's got to be sort of a, a hypothetical extended family because they're not really your family, but right. you have to create it. And you can't create it, right? Exactly. You can. And in, in fact, I think many people do that. Many people are successful at um, creating a healthy group of adults that can be uh, part of the, part child's, of the child's family. family. Right, exactly. It could be a community of faith. It could be your neighbors. It could be, uh, you know, the, the the elder people down the road who sort of play the role of surrogate grandparents. But I think in order to build that, you have to really be deliberate. You have to be mindful. You have to sort of think, all right, I, I really need to bring more people into the child's life. Right. We forget. I mean, this is an interesting thing, but most people don't realize this, that in, for 99.9% .9 of the time we've been on this planet, human beings have lived in these multifamily, right. um, extended communities, communities right. where the average number of developmentally mature individuals for every child who's developing is four to one. Okay. Which is the ideal. Which is, would be the ideal. And now we think it's incredible if there's a ratio of one adult to five children. We think that that's enriched. But that's one twentieth of what... Our brain it prefers. And what we need. And what, what we those need. children exactly. need. Exactly. Now, you, you also uh, have, have talked about schools and, and what schools are doing wrong. You mentioned, for example, music education, which we're going to be doing a show about that. Uh, you mentioned uh, you, they, need, they need recess. Uh, they need exercise. Exactly. Tell me how schools need to start thinking of changing so that we can have healthier children. Right. Well, there are a lot of things. In the, the interesting thing about human beings is that we have this opportunity this, to, to invent the way we live together. So human beings now live so differently than we used to 100 years ago. And part of that is because we have this capacity to create memory and to pass on what we've learned to the next generation. So we invent 
government, we invent language, we invent styles of living together, and sometimes those inventions are not biologically respectful. And, and what I mean by that is that we have certain biological needs and certain biological gifts. One biological need is the need to be relationally connected. Mm -hmm. And so we've invented educational models and caregiving models, early childhood models, that are essentially not meeting those relational needs. Mm -hmm. So what schools could do very easily to begin to replicate a healthier developmental environment would be to do heterogeneous clustering to try and replicate what happens in a one-room schoolhouse mm -hmm. where there's older children interacting with yes, Montessori younger does. children. Exactly. Montessori does that, yeah. That's a very developmentally healthy way for children to have to opportunities uh, to learn from somebody who's more mature, to practice with somebody who's your same age, and then to teach somebody who's younger. And all three of those things are, are important in healthy uh, learning processes. Now, why do you feel so strongly, though, about, like, recess and <coughs> exercise and lunch, and, you know, music yeah. education, yeah. the liberal arts. Right. Why do you feel strongly about that? If you look at the way the brain is organized, it's like you can envision an upside down triangle and the top part is the cortex where you mm -hmm. do all of your thinking. It's the, it's where we, it's where education is directed. This okay. is where we, you know, mathematics and history and all that stuff where is in the cortex. Lower parts of the brain are involved in motor movement and regulating heart rate and more simple Physical. regulatory functions. Mm -hmm. Now what most people don't realize is that these lower parts of the brain send connections up into these higher parts of the brain and influence how they function. So if these lower parts are, if you will, restless and dysregulated, you can't concentrate, you can't learn, you can't think clearly. So one of the things that you can do is to provide patterned, repetitive stimulation for these lower parts of the brain through music, exercise, healthy touch. All of those things, all of these sensory activities provide patterned, repetitive input and quiet down this part of the brain so the smart you know, the part of the brain is receptive to learning. So even though it's well-intended, you know, we think, oh boy, we're going to teach these kids, so what we need to do is have five hours of cognitive instruction, and we'll just teach and teach and teach and teach, but the reality is the brain says, hey, after I'm, 45 minutes, yeah, I need the I'm kind of... I'm burned out. I'm burned out. Let me sort of self-regulate. Let me sort of reset myself. And you reset yourself by reflective time, music and movement, uh, physical exercise, and, and other of these things that don't seem like their education, but essentially make you more capable of learning and creating and doing the things that we want our children to do. Well, that's why I also insist on vacation time. Exactly. Even for adults. Absolutely. And, and that's, you're absolutely right about that. Um, let's talk about, uh, you're very concerned, and I think parents generally are, about the violence in our movies, in our TV set. I don't think, do we understand as parents or as adults what an impact that can have on children? What have you studied about that? Well, it's, it's a complicated set of issues. And, and one, there's no doubt that our children are just bombarded with violence. And it is uh, permeating our video games. It permeates yeah, the media. <clears throat> And one of the things that we're trying to find out, and there, there are many people that are looking at this, but we're trying to understand what, what is the impact on the developing child of seeing right. all of these things. And what, what we've learned is that all of us, children, adolescents, adults, are influenced tremendously by, by seeing anything in a repetitive way. Mm. So, And this goes for all kinds of things, not just violence, but the images of self, of your body that are portrayed on the media. So a young girl growing up watching the media and reading our magazines thinks my body's not right. My body is not thin enough or my breasts aren't big enough or my hair is the wrong color. And so these, the continual bombardment of images and uh, beliefs and practices uh, get into our head in ways that we don't, we don't understand. always understand. Right. And they do influence the way we function. Mm. One of the most interesting set of studies that have been done about this is that they've shown that if you take a child, a healthy child, and they play a, a violent video game, the part of their brain involved in threat 
and fear will activate the same way as if they were actually in that experience. So in some ways we are... That can't be healthy. It, it, right, exactly. It, we are taking these children and we are providing pattern repetitive experiences that we really don't want to provide for them. Now, if you have a healthy child who grows up in a family where there's lots of other opportunities to see other things. appropriate ways right. to solve problems, the impact is probably not as great. But the, but the most vulnerable children who don't have uh, healthy adults around them a lot, children who are isolated, children who have been exposed to domestic violence, they actually end up having their existing regulatory problems made worse. They're much more likely to uh, be disinhibited. They're much more likely to ultimately be aggressive and violent with sure. others. Well, it amazed me that, that you were sharing that uh, 40% of children have some kind of trauma or uh, trauma event in yeah. their lives before yeah. they become adults. Yeah, it's pretty and, astounding. And it's, it's increasing, right? I mean, that's a concern of yours. It is increasing. Um, if you look at the number of children who are exposed to domestic violence, sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, serious natural disasters, car accidents, all that kind of stuff, by the time you're 18, uh, between 30 and 40 percent of uh, young adults will have been exposed to some traumatic experience. Which is amazing. That's almost half amazing. The, 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 the children's population. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the first six years of life. I think a lot of people don't understand the importance of touch of emotional yeah. attachment, yeah. Uh, of, you know, not neglecting your child those first. Why is that? What, what happens yeah. in the first six years of life to the child's brain uh, if we're not giving that child what, what it needs? Well, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. You know, the human brain is very complex, and it's got billions of little cells we call neurons. And then it has trillions of connections, which are the connections between one cell to another. And it's these connections that are functionally important. If you look at how the brain organizes and develops, by the time you're born, 95% of the neurons that are in your brain as an adult are already present. By the time you are five years old, 85% of the synaptic connections that you have for the rest of your life are in place. And by the time you're four years old, your brain is 90% adult size. So What's happening is that early in life, there's this rapid organization and development of the brain, which makes it exquisitely sensitive to experience. Now, the funny thing is that we all know this. We all know that you can take a little child and, and, and in a, an environment where you talk to them and teach them. By the, the time they're three years old, they, they walk and they talk and they speak and they've got all kinds of these things that they just picked up just like that. But the reality that we need to keep in mind is that children will pick up negative things just as quickly as they pick up these positive things. So if they're in environments that are chaotic or neglectful, they will absorb that and that will influence the organization of their brains and that will influence their emotional and their physical health for the rest of their lives. And it's, uh, it's this wonderful gift of nature that we have this early childhood period. But it's a gift that all too often we're not very respectful of. Right. We, we don't invest enough money. The people who we entrust our young children to are paid less than people that work at McDonald's. Um, the interesting thing is a preschool teacher will be working with a bunch of little preschool children and by virtue of her interactions during that day, she will be providing experiences that shape the emotional, the social, the cognitive, and the motor parts of the brain. A tremendous impact on, on these children. And we'll pay her nothing. Yeah, and then when you get to college, and the, and, the, and the professor in college gets paid five times, ten times as much as that person does, and, and they will be trying to change the tiniest little part of the tiniest little part of the tiny part of the cortex. So we have this odd disconnect about our values and our culture. And a great opportunity because if, if, if we are aware that those first six years of life, we can make a huge difference by yeah. just being more mindful of what you're saying. Uh, you know, when they're yeah. in college, we won't have to worry so much and spend so much money. Exactly. Um, exactly. Let's talk about your experience. You, you, um, I'm sure you've seen horrible things. You've been to Branch Davidian, September 11th, Katrina. I mean, you, you have been to the most traumatic events yeah. in our nation's history. And unfortunately, we're seeing more and more of those, Columbine shootings. 
Yeah. What do you wish more parents knew about trauma and children and trauma? That's a great question. I, um, the thing I, I, I wish most parents knew was that children who are exposed to traumatic experiences can be protected and healed from the adverse effects by the presence and engagement of the parent. That the parent is so much more powerful than they might than realize. Anybody else, yeah. And that, and and what, there are there are a couple of sort of mistakes that we adults tend to make about children. And one is that just because children can't talk about things, we assume that that they haven't been impacted. So they'll, uh, you know, I've been at, I was at a murder scene once where a world famous trauma specialist had developed a program to help people who had to come in and clean up the, the blood because he knew that the people who had to do this were traumatized by that experience. And I walked into this living room and there were three children there, it, literally with blood on them. And he was telling me about this program how great it was that they healed these adults that had to clean this up. And I said, well, what are you guys doing for the children? The kids. <laughs> what are you doing for the children? And he looked at me and he said, well, children are resilient. Mm -hmm. And I just mm -hmm. was shocked. So that even amongst some of our experts, there's this misunderstanding of what the impact of trauma can be on children. And it, it, you know, going back to what we just said earlier, if anything, children are more vulnerable to developmental trauma than adults because their brain is so rapidly organizing. It's growing, it's developing. It, exactly. And I think that, you know, that's one thing I think that adults and parents should be aware of. And the other one is, it, it is remarkable how much you can heal a child if you are present, if you are respectful, if you are understanding, uh, and if you are patient. And it doesn't take a lot of psychological insight. I mean, you don't have to have the right words to say. Right. You just have to be this loving presence. I, I thought it was very interesting you said that, you know, people think, oh, we'll just, we'll just give them therapy and, and, and yeah. get a good psychiatrist or a good psychologist yeah. and that'll be enough. No, yeah. you said it's the relationships that are persistent, that are permanent, that, that, that are there all the time. Exactly. And you have to have a commitment to that. And I want you to share the story of Mama P because you, you wrote yeah. a book about, about trauma and children and, and all these horrible things that have happened to children. And, and uh, what really stuck with me was this woman uh, yeah. because she represents a little bit of what you're talking about. Exactly. Um, when I was first starting out doing clinical work, um, you know, I, I, I <laughs> was... Uh, like many young physicians, um, overestimating my healing powers. <laughs> and, uh, the God complex, right? <laughs> right, right. It's, it didn't take too long to get rid of that. But one of, the, you know, one of the remarkable people I ran into in working with these maltreated children was a foster mother who was incredibly loving, uh, very patient, and very protective of these children who she called her babies. And even if the child was eight or nine or ten, they were her babies. And uh, she had this remarkable healing capacity. And there would be times, when I first was getting to know her, um, we evaluated a child that she was uh, taking care of and made some recommendations, which included, you know, a medication that might help something. And she looked at me and said, oh, no, oh, no, I'm not giving my babies any medications. And <laughs> I was like... <laughs> okay, okay. And, uh, and she said, what this child needs is to be held and rocked and loved. And that's what we're going to do. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and she taught me a lot. Um, you know, and over the years, I keep returning to that wisdom, that we see that in so many different ways. We see that the children who come through traumatic experiences, if they have stable and nurturing relationships they can sustain unbelievable trauma, whereas a child who has much less traumatic stuff... Experiences, yeah. It, if they don't have relational contacts, they deteriorate and they do terribly. So we found that the best predictor of how you do after a traumatic experience is not access to mental health care. Um, it, it is essentially the presence of safe and stable relationships. Amazing. Um, 
Tell me how you know you're living smart. <laughs> um, you know, I think I know I, I'm living smart because I keep questioning um, the way I'm living. You know, I, I keep trying to do self-evaluation. Um, can I think better? Can I exercise differently? You know, what, what's going to help me be a better parent and a, a, a better spouse, a better friend? And I, you know, I keep, believe me, I keep making lots of mistakes, but I keep trying to get better. And I think, that that's, I think that's a big key. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry, for Thank joining you. us. Really appreciate it. And to learn more about this topic, go to our website. There you'll also find a complete resource list. You can also email us or call us with your comments at 713-743-8513. And that's our show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to live smart. I'm Patricia Ross. Have a great week. A transcript of this program sends 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.